So now the Navi scheme will track more than $20 million in payments from a public company by threatening to use his ability to garner publicity to inflict financial and reputational harm on the company. Avenatti's conduct had nothing to do with zealous advocacy for a client or any other kind of legitimate legal work. Instead, Avenatti used illegal and extortionate threats for the purpose of obtaining, of obtaining millions of dollars in payments for himself. Avenatti repeatedly pressured the company to agree to pay or risk having Avenatti hold a press conference that he claimed would dramatically drive down the stock price of the company and its market value. As Avenatti threatened in one recorded meeting, if the company did not meet his demands, the company might die. But if not, it was, quote, going to be inflicted with cut after cut after cut after cut. As alleged, the entire scheme played out in less than a week. Avenatti first met with representatives of the company last Tuesday, March 19, in Manhattan. At that meeting, Avenatti said he represented a client who coached an amateur high school basketball team sponsored by the company, which is Nike. The team had recently lost that contract worth $72,000 a year, and Avenatti claimed the coach had information about potential misconduct by employees at Nike. The allegations of misconduct were similar in kind to those that formed the core of a prior criminal prosecution brought by our office, that payments were made to families of high school basketball players. In that meeting, and in subsequent conversations that were recorded as part of our investigation, Avenatti threatened to hold a press conference at which he would make these allegations public if the company did not agree to his financial demands. Avenatti promised to forego the press conference and allow the company to avoid financial harm if the company agreed to pay his client $1.5 million and for Avenatti himself to retain Avenatti and another co-conspirator to conduct a multi-million dollar internal investigation, an internal investigation that the company did not request. Avenatti made clear that he was approaching the company at a time intended to maximize the potential financial damage of such a press conference, namely on the eve of the annual NCAA tournament and the company's quarterly earnings call. As Avenatti threatened on one call recorded during the investigation, if the company did not accede to his financial demands and in his words, quote, I'll go take $10 billion off your client's market cap. In a recorded meeting the next day with representatives of the company, Avenatti made clear that he expected to be paid up to $25 million, with $12 million to be paid up front and deemed earned when paid. And when asked by a lawyer for the company why the company would agree to such an arrangement, Avenatti responded in substance that he had the company in a very vulnerable position where he could wipe out five to six billion dollars of its market capital. When the company's lawyers resisted paying Avenatti to conduct an internal investigation, Avenatti told the company it could skip paying for an internal investigation if instead it simply paid him $22.5 million. Then Avenatti said he would, quote, ride off into the sunset. Pressure and a sense of urgency were used in delivering these threats. As you can see from the timeline, this all happened in a period of three days. On day one, March 19th, a Tuesday, this was the first meeting between Avenatti, representatives from Nike, and the co-conspirator. At this meeting, Avenatti, for the first time, made his extortionate demands and threats. Following that meeting, Representatives from Nike called prosecutors at my office and informed our office of the extortion demands and threats made by Avenatti. Going forward, all interactions between Nike representatives and Avenatti were recorded and overseen by the FBI and my office. On day two, 
Wednesday, March 20th, there was a, a recorded phone call with Avenatti, the co-conspirator, and representatives from Nike, where Avenatti again made his threats and demands. And on day three, there was a meeting, which was recorded on Thursday, March 21st, last Thursday, in which Avenatti repeated his demands and threats. And as you can see, he graphically described his hold on the company. At the end of this meeting, on Thursday, they agreed that there would be one final meeting the, follow, the coming Monday, which is today. And at that meeting, Nike would either accede to Avenatti's demands or suffer the consequences. After that meeting, about two hours after that meeting, Avenatti decided to turn up the heat on Nike. He issued a tweet, and it said, something tells me that we have not reached the end of this scandal. And by scandal, he's talking about the college basketball corruption prosecutions brought by the Southern District of New York. The scandal is likely far, far broader than imagined. So while this tweet went out to the public, it was intended and designed for an audience of one. This was Michael Avenatti's shot across Nike's bow. Through the alleged course of conduct, Avenatti used legal terms like claims and settlements and retainers, but these were mere devices to provide cover for Avenatti's extortionate demands for a massive payday for himself. By engaging in the conduct alleged in the complaint, Avenatti was not acting as an attorney. A suit and tie doesn't mask the fact that, at its core, this was an old-fashioned shakedown. The charges announced today reflect the hard work not only of this office, but our law enforcement partners at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. To my left is my good friend, Bill Sweeney, the assistant director in charge of the FBI's New York field office. I want to thank him and his team for their professionalism in seeing this investigation through. I want to acknowledge and thank the career prosecutors and agents of my office for their role in the investigation and prosecution of this case. To my right is Matt Podolsky, Robert Boone, Rob Sobelman, and their supervisor in the Public Corruption Unit, Edward Discamp. The talent and professionalism of these uh, dedicated uh, public servants is, is really extraordinary. Our legal system, our system of justice, requires and relies on attorneys, members of the bar, to not simply follow the law, but uphold its finest principles and ideals. But when lawyers use their law licenses as weapons, as a guise to extort payments for themselves, they are no longer acting as attorneys, they are acting as criminals, and they will be held responsible for their conduct. I'd now like to invite Bill Sweeney to the podium. Thanks, Jeff. Earlier this afternoon, Michael Avenatti. All right, so that was Jeff Berman, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, detailing this case that New York now has on uh, Michael Avenatti, uh, a man who at one point expressed interest in running to be the next president of the United States, a man who represented, uh, uh, you know, adult film star Stormy Daniels, who, by the way, has reacted to all of this, saying that she is saddened but not shocked by, by the news of Avenatti's uh, charges. Again, these are two separate cases. It's California and New York, and you just heard the details out of New York, and let's 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 get into the nitty gritty. Uh, Elliot Honig is with me. It's your former uh, your former office there at SDNY. Um, so what I'm understanding is that this is all with Nike. He says he he has this client who's this high school coach, and they believe that this coach has this information on Nike, um, alleging misconduct on behalf of Nike employees. And if you don't let me do this internal investigation and pay my guy, you know, 1.5 million dollars, there's going to be a problem dot, 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 eventually it's, they obviously express they don't want to do this investigation. He says, well, I can run off into the sunset with a cool 22.5 million. And they say, not so fast. Right. 
more, and more to the point, they go to the FBI in the Southern District of New York. Uh, if you're going to try to extort someone, don't try to extort Nike. They're, they're pretty well represented and pretty savvy. Um, this is an interesting case, though. Um, this is actually a close call in terms of extortion. I think we just saw the U.S. Attorney, Jeffrey Berman, already anticipating that. Because two sentences in, he said... This was not just aggressive advocacy, because that's going to be Michael Avenatti's defense here. Okay. Look, my client had some sort of legal claim. He had some sort of contractual claim against you, Nike, uh, and I offered to come in and do the legal work. Yes, the demands were very high. Yes, I used harsh language. Yes, I was aggressive, but welcome to the real world. This is how business and hard-knuckled legal negotiations work. And the trick for the prosecutors here is going to show that the use, the threats here were what's called very helpfully in the law, wrongful, which means, right, uh, welcome, right. To the welcome to the law. <laughs> but you have to look at all the different facts and decide, did this sort of cross a line? And I think here the prosecutors are going to say, well, look, he, he exerted this immense time pressure. He leveraged it right when the NCAA tournament was about to start, right when their uh, Nike's company meeting was about to happen. He threatened their, not just, not just their sort of profitability, but their market cap. Um, he used his own abil his own fame. He said, look, he basically says in these recorded calls, people pay attention to me and I can really damage you. And the question for a jury maybe will be, is that over the line? That's a defensible case, though. So it is a defensible case. So between yeah. the case in New York and, and the case in California, which should make him sweat a tad more? Yeah, I never say this. There's less of a threat out of the Southern District of New York, more of a threat out of California. The California case is really straightforward financial fraud. There's two aspects to the California case. The, the, the more problematic one, I think, is the theft of $1.6 million from his own client. It doesn't get any worse than that yeah. from an attorney. His client got this settlement. Avenatti lied to him, allegedly falsified documents, and just pocketed the money for himself and then paid him, paid the client a little bit of it, but, but pocketed the rest. I mean, I don't know how you defend against that. And the other piece is a garden variety bank fraud. Uh, where he inflated his assets. A lot of people living above their means do this. Uh, and he got $4 million in loans that I assume he wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Th those are first, second year type prosecutor cases. That's a straightforward financial, and you can do it all on financial documents. Okay. Ellie Honig, you were the best. Thank, Thank you, you so much.